So listen, we are continuing, uh, actually we're concluding our series on Get In The Game, although I'm a little sad about the jerseys going away. It's been pretty nice not to figure out what to wear for the last month and just be comfy. But anyway, we'll keep it moving. Nobody else. Okay. All right. Everybody, <laughs> inhale, <laughs> exhale, shake it out. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's been a morning, but God is here, and we get to have joy in the midst of everything. Um, so today, on this last Sunday of the series, we want to talk about growing the team. Now, I recognize that it would have been far more in line with the whole theme if I'd have talked about recruiting, right? We, we go out and we recruit. But see, recruiting is selling somebody on something. Recruiting is getting them to choose you over something else, selling why you're better. And we don't need to sell Jesus. We want to grow the team through invitation. That's what we're called to do. But God doesn't need us to be a, a billboard or a sales pitch. It's not a program. It's love. It's invitational love. And so last week, we talked through our, our vision statement, our mission statement for the year. And part of that was that little word, invitational, in, in front of an invitational discipleship, right? And I said we'd talk more about that later. But today is later, and that's what we want to dig into today. Um, because it's important that we understand that becoming an invitational community is the assignment of the Big C Church. It's part of the Great Commission, and it's at the heart of God himself. And so I want to invite you today, one, half of you who were at least leaning in with a little enthusiasm on this dreary, rainy day, heard me say, we're going to talk about inviting, and went, oh, no, it's that sermon. Oh, y'all not going to be honest in the room, because... All right, well, we'll just keep it moving then. Um, I, I want to start by reading something to you. It's a foreword in a book uh, called Unlocking Your Church's Invite Culture, but, but the foreword is not by the author, and the foreword is what really captured my attention as I researched for this. So I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine a door. No, really, close your eyes and imagine a door. Can you see it? Behind that door in your mind's eye are hundreds and thousands of people. The people behind that door are not a nameless, faceless mass of hum humanity. If you peek behind the door, you will see your neighbors, your parents, the parents of your kids' friends from school, some of your own family, the barista at your favorite cafe the server at your favorite restaurant, and so many more. None of these people are on the other side, none of these people on the other side of the door are strangers. They are all people that you and the individuals in your church know by name. People that you love and people that you see every week. The door is a church door and the door is locked. Your neighbors Friends, family, and coworkers are all locked outside of the church, and you are locked inside of the church. They can't get in, and you can't get out. All right, you can open your eyes. What I just described and what I hope you saw in your imagination is the way it has been for a generation in the Western church. We are on the inside, and they are on the outside. We don't know how to get to them, and they have no idea that there is hope, grace, and purpose on the other side of the door. I want to take us back for a minute to the Great Commission. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Great Commission. And I want to ask you to read that with me. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always till the very end of the age. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 
Therefore, go. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in. See, the first thing that we really have to accept is that we are called to be invitational. Like, let's be honest, I'm a discipleship girl at heart. I get excited about life change happening. I get excited about you applying this to your life or me applying that to my life and getting one step closer to be like the little Christs that we talked about last week. But we can't skip invitation. Step one of the Great Commission is invitation. The problem, if we're being honest, is that when most of us think of being invitational or, or the pastor standing up and saying, church, we need to be invitational, the image we get is not of the locked door with the people we love on the outside. If we're really being honest, it's kind of an image of like the zombie apocalypse, except we're the zombie chasing people down the street with an invitation to church while they run away or get mad at us and fight back. Am I not telling the truth? When I say, go invite people to church, you're like, oh, they're going to hate me. They're going to run away from me. They're going to fight me. Hmm. But is that the heart of God? The enemy has duped us into feeling like we have something that they don't want and they don't need. And instead of walking in that church, I want to invite us to walk in the truth of the fact that in our hands, we hold the golden ticket. Nobody gets the movie reference there. Y'all really asleep this morning. Willy Wonka, like we have the golden ticket, except there's not five of them. There's a limitless number of them because when Jesus came out of that tomb, raised to life, he printed a limitless number of golden tickets and it's our job to go and share them with the world. But if we're still being honest, even if you didn't get the whole zombie thing, that's not how it feels. And that's not what the church does. I wanna share some stats with you. It's not gonna be all stats. I have two stat slides or two fact slides to share with you guys today. Um, and so I want you to check this out with me. Now this is from a 2018, so pre-COVID, it's only gotten worse. Barna, who does great research, like a very well-respected research organization, 2018 Barna stats for church-going Christians. Not just for people who say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but only go to church once every 10 years or maybe Christmas and Easter. Church-going Christians, this is what invitational looks like. 38% have no non-Christian friends. How can we be in the world, not of the world, if we don't have any friends who, okay, I'm gonna leave that there. We'll talk about that more later. 51% have never heard of the Great Commission. Now, I would challenge that statistic and say, mm, maybe 51% don't realize they've heard the Great Commission or they've forgotten it. I'd like to think that pastors out there are making it a little higher than 51% of the people or 49% of the people that know. But just so we're clear, what did we read at the beginning of the service? The, gr the Great Commission. One of you, two of you said it. We read the Great Commission. That is the Great Commission. How about this? 27% think it's wrong to share their faith. Oh, but wait for it. 47% of millennial church-going Christians, almost double, 47% think it's wrong to share their faith. See, that's our culture today. That's a post-Christian, post-modern culture. You know what else? 94% of millennial Christians think, can I get any guesses? Somebody be brave and guess what they might think. No guesses? <laughs> Good guess. 97%, or sorry, 94% of millennial Christians when 47% don't think that it's okay to invite people to church, think it's wrong, 94% believe that the best thing that could ever happen to anyone is that they encounter and have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Does anybody else see a great divide in that? If 94% believe that the number one thing that could happen to change someone's life for the better is that they have a relationship with Jesus, then why do 47% of them think it's wrong to invite people to church? And how do we look at scripture to unlock the real truth? Because I can stand up here and pitch all day long at you guys, but that's just a recruiting pitch. How do we unlock the truth of scripture to root our hearts in such a way that we actually become invitational? I'd say that we have to change our mindset. The, the picture of what invitation looks like, and it can't be chasing people down the street with an invitation and them running away or fighting back. Let me see if I can get a few agreements. The world is a pretty dark place. Yes? Agree? Disagree? Agree? Okay. The world is increasingly angry. The, the, the nation is increasingly divided. Agree? We are all increasingly afraid. Yeah. Some, of the, uh, some of the guys didn't want to, uh, yeah, like they were, yeah. But let me ask the next school shooting you see, are you, how do you feel about sending your kids to school the next day? Or the next riot that takes place? Or the next injustice that happens? Or the next war? Or the next fight? Or the next just ridiculous childishness on a platform by two people that are supposed to, one of them, be the leader of our nation. We're all increasingly afraid. I'll go back to angry. I'll get more amens. It's fine. And all of that, like I was typing that, and I have to be honest, like all of that is true, and all of that is happening. And, and the song, it's an old song, but all I could hear in my head was, and I can't sing, so bear with me, but what the world needs now is love. Sweet love, da 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 da. Yep, that. And we have the golden ticket of love. We have the thing that the world needs. Remember what David Ferguson said about the people on the other side of the door? It wasn't that they couldn't get in for some other reason, it was that they had no idea that there was hope and grace and purpose for their lives on the other side of the door. Matthew 5, 14 to 16, this is Jesus, by the way, tells the people, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill could not be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, I want to be honest. I was hoping to work this out with Pastor Rick this morning and everything kind of happened. I had this whole idea of turning the lights out and having the bright flashlight, you know. This illustration does not impact us as much in our modern world with electricity and, and masses of people and big cities and even towns aren't little towns anymore because we see light all the time. But when Jesus said this, the only light came from fire and lightning, <laughs> the moon and the sun and the stars. And yes, I know light's actually reflecting off the moon and the stars. Nobody, I, I know. But there weren't all these other sources of light. So when it was dark, y'all, it was dark. And when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, in the complete darkness of night, you are the light. And you can't hide that down. Anybody who had light in utter darkness would hold it up in front of them to light their path and it would draw other people to it. And so how can we shift our imagery from the only light we see when we think about invitation being on the torches, pushing back us and our invitations to the fact, the truth, that we're actually the light of the world. 
and in the world that is getting increasingly angry and increasingly scary and increasingly divided and increasingly dark, we have the hope, the grace, and the purpose for healing. Even more, if we're being honest all over again, how do we shift the perspective of the people we want to invite? Because honestly, when we look at the Big C Church and some of our evangelistic tactics, it's no wonder they run away screaming or coming back with torches. (laughs) Because we haven't been invitational. To be invitational, you actually have to be attractional. Did you know that? Yeah, I, I know, it's a made-up word, but it's used a lot. Pastor Rick was like, that's not a word. It's, it, you, you have to pick a different word for the slide. I'm like, no, there's a tractional church. And, we get in, and the church gets in fights about, we can't be attractional, we have to be missional. We can't be attractional, we have to be discipling. Like the Great Commission doesn't have invitation and discipling linked together. Do you know that invitation and evangelism are the first part of discipleship? It's not separate. You have to invite people to Jesus. You have to be attractional. They have to go from believing there's not God to considering, uh, hmm, I don't think there's God to, I can't explain why those people are so happy because I know them and I know them to be true people, but something's weird to all the way up the scale to they say yes to Jesus. That's all discipleship. And that has to be attractional to move them from a negative 10 to actually believing that Jesus is who he says that he is. So if we could get set in our minds that attractional is not a bad word, it does not mean shallow church. I sat in three community groups this week, three bridge builders groups. They all had good, deep, rich conversation about actual life application. It was all good stuff. None of it was shallow. Attractional is not a bad word, and it is not the opposite of discipling. It is the on-ramp that we provide people for a path to Jesus. The problem is that in our Western culture, the big C church has not been great at being attractional. I told you I was going to have three or two slides for you, fact slides. I've got one more bit of research for you. Craig Springer, who was the former executive director of an organization called Alpha that originated in the UK where they have been postmodern, post-Christian for two more decades than we have. Tremendously effective organization. He's now, uh, he's now working with Barna. But he, in through a whole ton of interviews, 600 uh, churches or 700 churches, thousands of people, a, a half a dozen years, came with, up with this. The three least helpful qualities in Christians. As identified. Now, not, not that just any person on the, on the street would say, Alpha is actually a place where people can come explore what faith is, if there's a God, all that. So people who are identified as being spiritually curious, non-Christians. So not people walking in the door proclaiming they're atheists and they want to destroy the church, right? Like, by the way, not every atheist wants to destroy the church. That's an unfair representation. So what do you think those three qualities might be? Like, just put your thinking caps on for a minute. Let's go ahead and show those. Christians who have all the answers, least attractive qualities. Christians who have all the answers. Christians who are quick to point out the flaws in other people's perspectives. That couldn't be right. Muhammad couldn't really be a prophet. Islam is wrong. This is this. Buddhists are crazy. You name it. Christians who are quick to point out the flaws in other people's perspectives. Christians who are good at debating topics. Guys, I have nothing against apologetics. But in a postmodern culture, apologetics are a discipling tool. They are not invitational or attractional. If you don't know what that means, it's just being really good at debating Jesus. Debating for Jesus. We don't need to argue anybody into the kingdom that does not work. 
And if we're being honest, if we're not in our parents' or our grandparents' culture anymore. And so before you think I'm asking you to be a better marketer, Jesus actually gives us some really clear instructions on being attractional and, and being a good representation of Jesus in the world and in the community. And by the way, they weren't a postmodern, post-Christian world. They were a pre-modern, pre-Christian world. So they faced all the stuff that we're facing because Jesus was new on the scene. Messiah had just happened in our timeline. And God teaches us how to be attractional. Okay, I know it's a rainy day. I know we had a lot of excitement slash scary this morning. God got all that. I actually need some really big reading voices, okay? I don't want to feel like the first grade, second grade teacher. Shani, I'm going to have to get you up here. <laughs> but I want you guys to, to read this with me, okay? Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let your conversation be full of facts. Let your conversation be full of arguments. Let your conversation be full of judgment. No. Let your conversations be full of grace, always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Be wise in how you act towards people who don't yet know Jesus. Understand what being attractional sounds like. Wise, making the most of every opportunity. Wisdom is more than information, church. You know that, right? Wisdom is more than an informational exchange. Wisdom understands when and how to share information for the greater purpose and the greater intention. Ask me how I know because redheads have to go to extra wisdom school over and over and over again. Successful church in a postmodern culture doesn't tell people what to believe, but gives them a safe space to explore and discover their own faith. Hear me, our job is to give them hope in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying universalism, I'm not saying anything else like that, but people gotta figure that out and we can't meet them at the door telling them universalism is wrong and they're going to hell. We have to create a safe space for them to come explore who God is, who God is to them, what God looks like, how God reveals himself, and how God actually displays himself through the community that is the church. And, and in previous generations, guys, we gotta get this. In previous generations, people believed before they belonged. You believed in God when the televangelist presented something. You believed in God when the people knocked at your door and gave you a track. You believed in God, and then because you believed in Jesus, you went and found a church, or the person that got you to believe in Jesus took you to church. The question in the 1970s and 80s, some of you know it, if you died tonight, do you know where you would end up? Now I have to say, I don't know that scare tactics were effective even in the 70s and 80s. But that question made assumptions that were common, fair assumptions in the 70s and 80s, which was that people believed in an afterlife and they generally believed God was good. And they just had to figure out how to get to him. Get to him. This is not our culture. Today, people belong before they believe. And for some of us who are a little more seasoned, <laughs> a little further in years, it's hard to comprehend that people have to belong and then they would believe. Like, why would somebody come to church for six months and not actually believe in Jesus? Because they're exploring their faith. They're seeing if there's authenticity to what we're saying. It's one of the reasons that I'm really excited that in a month we're going to start a Discover Bridge class. So once a month, anybody who's visited gets invited to stay after church and hear about, ask us about our core values, what we believe, who we are as a church. 
has the opportunity to come and ask. People need to see that we are authentic. And through our authenticity, they'll begin to see that God is authentic, that God is real, that God is actually the light and the hope and the grace and the love that we say that he is. If we're going to be successful at that invitation, then we have to understand that invitational in our culture, invitational in a postmodern society, in that the question is not avoid hell by choosing Jesus and coming to church. The invitation is not that. The invitation is simply come and see. What's pretty amazing is that was Jesus' invitation. Come and see. The woman at the well who had her life radically transformed by Jesus ran, left her thing at the well, left her pitcher at the well, left the the guilt and shame of all her previous husbands at the well and ran into town to gather everybody and say, come and see. I have met the man who's told me everything I've ever done. He's the Messiah. Come and see. The invitation doesn't need to be scary. The invitation is as simple as, there's some really awesome stuff we're doing in the community. Why don't you come check it out? Would you like to come to church this weekend? I get to hang out with some really great people. You know what I hear all the time from visitors when Pastor Rick and I sit down? You guys are really friendly. Your people are genuinely friendly. We felt welcome. Some of you who are sitting here today have said those words to me over and over. We felt so welcome when we walked in the door. You know what? That's awesome because you can tell people who are lonely and who need friends. There's an awesome group of people. They're really welcoming and they're really friendly and we have a great time. Why don't you come check it out? God's do- We're doing some great stuff in the elementary school. We're doing some great stuff in the community. I'm not saying eliminate God from that conversation. I never do. When I talk to our friends who are not believers, I don't ever just say, oh, that was good luck. Man, what a blessing. God had favor. My hope is in Jesus. Can I pray for you? I don't skip those conversations. But the invitation isn't, Do you know you're going to go to hell if you don't say yes to Jesus? The invitation is come and see. Why is that so hard? Why do so many people never get comfortable sharing with anyone an invitation to come to church? I said I was not going to, I was only going to give you two statistics. I didn't read the last two that I had in that one spot, so I'm going to toss it out there because it's in my reminder notes. 80 to 95 percent of people never intend to invite anyone to church, of church-going people. In churches that are not growing, 95 percent of people never intend to invite another human being to church. In churches in North America that have been growing over the last 10 years, 80% of people still don't ever plan to invite a single person to church. I want to go back to something I said last week. If someone saved your life, you have a choice to make. You can either thank them and cheer them on for saving your life and cheer on people like them or you can become someone who saves other people's lives. And as Christians, we aren't just supposed to cheer two out of every 10 people in our congregation on to go invite people. We're supposed to be. Shawnee, it is quiet in this house today. I'm assuming it's because we're all taking it in. And if we're being honest, the main reason we don't do that goes back to fear. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of people judging us and thinking less of us, thinking we're not smart because we believe in God. Fear of people just being like, I don't want to 
go to church with you, fear, fear that our friendships will erode away because the best thing we have in our lives when we offered it, someone got mad. And those are all tactics of the enemy. Public service announcement, I'm really excited. We start a new series called Battlefront next week. We're gonna spend a month digging into all the tactics of the enemy and how we stand against them and walk in victory. But as usual, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's go back to fear. We don't invite people because we fear failing ourselves. We fear failing God. We fear failing our friends that were invited. We fear failing our church. And with scripture, I just want to take some of the weight off, their, off your shoulders. Because remember that Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As much as we are commanded to be an invitational community, as much as we are commanded to be the salt and light, as much as we are commanded, I keep wanting to pull it back, but it's not. It's commanded to go into the world and make disciples. The command is in the invitation. Our obedience, our faithfulness to that command is to invite, to be invitational. It is not to cross the finish line with someone. Our job as disciplers in teaching people to obey everything that God has commanded them, that means we actually have to understand what God has commanded us. In Acts 1.8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all of Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Not you will be my kidnappers. Not I will send you out like, like a little stealth special ops team and snatch and grab people and drag them into church till they waterboard them, till they say yes. No. Be my witnesses. Faithfulness to obey the commands have nothing to do with how people respond to us. It has everything to do with our faithfulness to obey the command, to invite. So let's, let's talk about something because if failure is the number one fear, and it is, then failure equals could invite, should invite, don't invite. Faithfulness, success, victory in this whole invitational thing. Faithfulness equals could invite, should invite, do invite. Not do bring a visitor in with you every week. Not do drag people in off the streets. Not do badger people till they say yes. With wisdom, full of grace, be invitational and invite. Our job is planting seeds and growth is up to God. So how is seed planting going? Mm. Mm. Still quiet. Okay, I hear one mm response to me. How is seed planting going? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. That's why, and by the way, guys, we're not gonna create an invitational culture overnight. Now we have, by the way, we're in the growing church thing, like we're a church plant. People get excited. I know things are a little light today. It's a rainy day and lots is happening, but, but we are statistically a very growing church. But I'd say that 80% is not an invitational, or 20% of people inviting and 80% not is not an invitational culture. And if we're going to become an invitational culture, it's not going to happen overnight. Guess what? I'm not sending you out with invitations for next week to invite people to church. We're going to do that in the future. I would love it if you invited someone into our next sermon series talking about an opportunity. Man, there is so much darkness in the world, but there is light. That's what we're going to talk about this week. You want to come with me to church? Can I pick you up? Could I take you to church? We can go to lunch afterwards, whatever. We can get a coffee. Clarity makes it so easy. But, uh, but I'm not sending you out with 10 invitations. By the way, 10 invitations a week are not relational. That's a sales pitch. That's not what God calls us to do. But I'm also not just trying to make you feel better by saying that the faithfulness and success looks like you inviting. We learn in scripture, in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, 7, 
Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, and they're having an argument about, do they follow Paul? Do they follow Apollos? Who's a better teacher? Who did they come to faith underneath? Who recruited them into the kingdom? See, they had the wrong impression going on. And Paul responds to him, and he says, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. The Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seeds, Apollo watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything but only God who makes it grow. Invitation is at the heart of God, church. He, he ensured, like I haven't had a football analogy all day, and this really isn't either, but he ensured that he had the best team out there. Remember, when you join the team, you get the Super Bowl ring. It's already done. Victory's already ours. Hope and light and grace and love, they already belong to us. It's the best team to be on. And you know what? There's no tryout. Nobody gets cut from this team. If you show up and you say yes to the jersey, that's it. You win. Now, there's a lot of grades of winning. And abundant life has a lot. That's the discipleship piece. But in the invitation... It's simple. And as Paul talks to the church in Corinth, what I think I want to say to us, as we get anxious, if we really begin to think about becoming invitational and inviting people to church, and there's a couple of you that do it very well. Maybe you'll teach class. No, um, no classes, just kidding. Uh, but as we think of becoming invitational and the anxiety starts to rise up, let me... Let me, as your pastor, I did that so I could see you because reading glasses, I don't, <laughs> you're blurry when I look out. Success is defined by faithfulness, not by finish lines. I'm never going to turn to you and ask, who have you brought to church this year? I'm going to look in the mirror and ask myself, who have I invited to church this year? Who have I been invitational to? Who have I been attractional to with the word and the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. That's where our success is. The reality is that God has set up this huge banquet, this feast. He talks about it in Revelation. It, it's a feast. And he's done all the work. And our only responsibility is to invite people in. And in doing that, we have to remember that it's not about us. It's not about how good we are or aren't at it. It's not about if we're going to get brownie points in the kingdom for being invitational. It's not about if I get to walk in with my shoulders all high because I have a visitor with me this week. It's not about us. It's about them. It's about the people who are standing outside the door, who don't even know that there's hope and love and grace inside. Can we show that, take the lights down and show that video, please? I need you to do something that's probably a big deal for you. You're going to see me this week, and I need you not to walk past me. I need you to work through your fear because I'm working through mine and I just I just need you to invite me in and if I act like I'm not interested in going to church with you still I need you to ask me to come I need you to help me see God <laughs> I don't even know what that means I need you more than you know because look, at the end of the day, God said he loved me enough to die for me. I mean, that is the claim, right? And if he died and he didn't stay dead, your church will be full this weekend. Your church could be full this weekend with people just like me. Different face, different skin color, different age, 
sex or social status. But make no mistake, I could be sitting right next to you. I just need you to invite me in, that's all. Nothing more, nothing less. And nothing complicated. And nothing driven by guilt. Just invite me in. I need you to. I really do. The world just needs an invitation. The bottom line is the invitation is at the very heart of God. It's why the Father sent the Son and to be his church, Bridge Church, to be his church, we must align our hearts and our actions with the invitational heart of God.